We can say what's the natural log, in which case it'd take the natural log of each element. We can use the apply, one of the apply family of functions. In this case, we're saying when you say margin equals 1 or 2, margin equals 1 means all rows, margin equal 2 means columns. This means find the minimum in all of the rows. And so we get the minimum is in all the rows. Here, let's look at A again quickly, is this. So the minimum of the first row is 1. Minimum second row, 5, 9, 3, right? So if we do that, we get 1, 5, 9, 3. The minimum of the columns are 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if we, uh, I'm sorry, we're doing the maximum of the columns. The maximum is the function. 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, so we get that. Okay, so um, you can do, there are many functions in R, row means, row columns. These are vectorized functions. Um, sweep is a, sweep's another function. Let's, um, let's do one more thing here and uh, we'll come back to sweep. Take a look at lists quickly. I'll tell you what, let's do sweep. Sweep's important. Sweep is a very powerful function. It's one that is it's hard to understand initially because it actually, it performs um, a vectorized operation on all of the elements, but it usually performs more than one operation, as in this case. It's called sweep because you're sweeping out all of the elements or you're performing some sort of what is often a complex calculation against all of the elements. For example, here, if we say take the minimum of A and store that in M and take a look at M, so M looks like this, M's 1, and then here we're saying sweep A, both rows and columns, um, by this value 1 and the function subtract. So you're saying subtract 1 from all of the all of a so a right now remember what it looks like now it's just uh, one one to sixteen right so if we if we sweep it with this it will subtract one from every element so now it's zero one two three to fifteen and if we say what's the maximum of a one fifteen here we're going to divide each of the elements for our 0 to 15 matrix by this one value 15. We're sweeping it. Sweep has four or five arguments, at least four, in which case the object you're sweeping, the elements of, of that object that you are uh, that you are sweeping, the the value and the function. Okay, so if we do that, sweep's very powerful and can affect a change to the entire, okay, so much for that. Let's take a look at lists quickly. Okay, here's an interesting, okay, this is a, a precursor to the simulation material. Um, way back when, lists are a structure that is the most versatile and useful. Um, generally, all of the data structures in R that you use in your analyses, in your research, will be data frames, generally. A data frame is like a spreadsheet. Think of a data frame as a spreadsheet where each column is a variable. In one column, all of the elements must be the same type, but you can have different types across columns. One column could be date data, another column could be numeric, another column could be factor. In a data frame, it's rows and columns, two-dimensional. The rows have to be the same length. The columns must be the same length. It looks It's just like a spreadsheet with some other subtle differences. These are the data sets that you're going to be analyzing. However, the return from these functions that you apply when you perform a regression, when you perform uh, a cluster analysis, when you perform 
a, a multi a MANOVA, when you perform a mixed model analysis and you run, an, you run an, a function, an MLE function or an LM function or one of those on your data frame, almost every time what gets returned is a list. It's no longer a data frame. Why do they do that? Just to make your life hard? No. A list is extremely versatile. A list is a data structure that consists of components, and each component can be and is an object. Each component can be a data structure of any type, of any size, of any length. Think I like to think of a list this way. Let's say you walk out of your house and you look in the backyard and you've got a lot of kids, like I used to a couple of years ago. And you've got all this junk lying around your yard. You've got different toys, bicycles, toys, uh, books, who knows, sitting around the yard. And you take this string and you, a piece of twine, and you tie, you attach, you take the string and you tie, you attach each one of these objects to the string. So now you have a string with each one of these disparate objects attached to it. That string is a list. That string is very analogous to what a list structure is. A list consists of components. Each one is completely different and can be any size, any type. Some could be factors, some could be text, some could be numbers. And a list is recursive. You can have lists within lists. So what, what is this? What's the practicality? Well, the practicality is you can build extremely complex structures with lists. That's one implication. Another one is when you perform a function like, like regression or simulation, you perform a simulation function, the, re, the, the data that gets returned is going to have many, it's going to have several attributes. You're going to have a mean, you're going to have a maximum, a minimum, you're going to have variance, you're going to have all of these different parameters resulting from your whatever your function is that you want to keep you you there's no other structure you could preserve all that return from other than a list a list permits you to put everything in different components so all of these numerical functions that we'll be using of any complexity always return a list. okay well, what's going on here Here's a data set about horse kicks, and it goes back to the Prussians, where Prussian officers collected data. They wanted to know the number of deaths of soldiers in cavalry corps corps, uh, uh, that had fatalities from horse kicks over a 20-year period. So they gathered this data. So here are the number of deaths over this 20-year period. And here are the core years they took for each core, the number of years. And so this would be 109 core years. And this would be uh, 165 core years. Here are the deaths. Okay, so deaths, it, deaths appear to be a, a counting variable. We have counts based on this x. This is a predictive variable. Okay, this is gross. This is a rough measure, right? So we want to figure out what, what distribution this looks like. How could we predict what we're trying to do is predict the deaths. Based, these are obser observations. We have observed data, and we want to create a model. That they, that's what they were doing. They, the Prussian officers wanted to be able to predict how many people would be killed by horse kicks based on this, this is the only data they have. So... We have to record the data, so we do that in R. So the number of disc deaths K becomes a vector, 0 to 4. The number of core years is our predictor variable vector X. Now, our first guess would be, well, it's counting. So probably binomial or Poisson. But before we commit to using one of those functions, one of those probability distribution functions, to estimate the best fit, we should investigate our observed data a bit more. Okay, so we'll do that, and we could do it a couple of ways. Um, R is very good at plotting, and so we could quickly, we could do a bar plot, so we do that. 
So here's our here's the frequency distribution, and sure enough, it looks Poisson. Okay, where most of them are zeros, and then one, twos, and threes. Okay, it's frequency bar charts, bar plots are frequencies. So um, we can also we could compute exactly the relative frequency distribution. Um, for for these ones, zeros, ones, we have 200 altogether, and we know that 65 of them were one, right? So we could do that. So let's um, let's create a vector that's got the sample proportions of the depth counts, where x is going to be the number of uh, core years, and then I'm sorry, x yes, x will be the the number of core years over the total. Okay, so we do that. So we have we'll have the probabilities for successively for zero death, one death, two deaths, three deaths, four deaths. We could also look at the center of this distribution, which is just the sample mean, so that's going to be the sum of pk, p times k. And it's close to zero, as you would expect, typical of a Poisson. So the mean is, and mean really is not that meaningful because we're a median or a mode, actually. A mode probably would be better, but a mode is not precise enough. Okay, so we're going with the mean, which is 0.61. And the variance, let's go for the variance too, so we, we can compute that exactly. And we, we find that... Um, the mean, 0.61, and the variance are very close, and they're small, which is, which is classic of a Poisson distribution. The small mean and the, the equal small variance that's almost exactly the same indicates probably predicting deaths based on core years would be best approximated using Poisson. So we do. So we'll use, um, you may be familiar with the R poise, the R norm. What R poise does, R poise is an R function that will, that will simulate a, a, any number of observations that have the characteristics of whatever the random variable is, whatever the probability di distribution function is, Poisson, normal, gamma, exponential, whatever sort of data set that you want to generate. This is reverse engineering data to, uh, to be able to, to then forward, sim forward engineer simulation. But we're not doing that here. Right now, we have data. 